When I first heard about Bitcoin, it seemed just like this very stupid magic internet money. I didn't really think it was very impressive at all. And I kept reading, and within a couple hours, I became absolutely hooked. I was skeptical at first, didn't think it could possibly work, but have the skills to actually go in and look at it and convince myself that technically it was correct that it could actually work. It was just a, an experiment to begin with, but I could see the potential with it. It's a fundamental innovation. That's, that's how I think of it. Bitcoin is the most important invention, um, at least since the internet. Ask yourself, which is more important in your life, money or email? And I think most people will say money, so this is bigger than email. It's just an incredibly novel and interesting solution to problems. The short version of what is Bitcoin is Bitcoin is cash for the internet. So it's a new kind of money and it's also a payment network that runs over the internet. There's a, a piece of digital information that you can hold that has value. And as long as nobody else knows that information, that value belongs to you. This sort of technology was developed independently a few times. I think the NSA developed it in the 70s, and then economic cryptographers started putting this out later in the, in the 90s. And it's called public key cryptography. Now, we now rely on that technology every time your phone talks to your bank or even over maybe SMS sometimes. I mean, it's just, it's just embedded in, our, in the internet and how we, how we talk. Bitcoin was invented by Satoshi Nakamoto. As far as I know, no one has actually met Satoshi. No one knows who he or she or they are. I've never talked with Satoshi, although I have communicated with him electronically by email or on online forums. Satoshi started working on Bitcoin, he says, in 2007. And it actually took him a couple of years to convince himself that he could actually create a system that would work, that would solve this problem of how do you create a money where there's no single person or organization or government in charge? He started posting to a cryptography mailing list where he described kind of at a high level how it would work and started to get feedback from people on uh, his idea. I believe it was the beginning of 2009, he released a, an academic paper that described the system in detail. And he also started up Bitcoin. He actually released the code for the system and started it running. Coming from a crypto background, I mean, one of the first things I did was I read the paper. When you read the paper uh, and you have that background, you think, this is very good. <laughs> you think, you know, there are, there are kind of 50 things that might be wrong with a proposal like this. And I thought, this answers all those questions. I mean, I thought, this is some very high quality work. So the key problem that Satoshi solved that made the whole system work was uh, a solution to what's called the double spending problem. So if I have this digital asset that I want to give to somebody else, how do you prevent me from giving it to two different people at the same time? Because obviously if it's digital, it's easy to copy. And Satoshi came up with a, a brilliant system for if you try to do that, if you try to double spend and give the same Bitcoins to two different people at the same time, everybody notices and then one or the other of those transactions is considered valid and the other one's just ignored. So solving the double spend problem was the key technical breakthrough that, that made Bitcoin possible even. Bitcoin answers another question in a magical way, which is, you know, could a bunch of people who don't trust each other all agree on when something happened so precisely that you could use it to transfer value, right? Um, and that sounds like, you know, who've never met each other and will never meet just by passing messages. And, you know, I mean, the immediate answer to that is like, no way, no way. You need someone who's trusted in the middle to tell people what happened. You need, you know, you need all these other things. So I, I do think it's, it's, it's incredible genius. He's obviously had some academic training because he wrote this academic white paper that, you know, is in the style of a peer-reviewed academic journal article. And he's obviously a genius. I mean, not only was he able to come up with the idea, but he was able to actually implement it, actually write code that made it work. And he was a genius on a lot of different levels, which I think is really rare and uh, fascinating, and I'd love to meet him someday. 
Satoshi sort of, I think, exists now in the Bitcoin subconscious almost. Things are named after him. It'll be a little bit like finding out who Santa Claus really is if Satoshi's ever revealed. Like, I think it'll be a blow to the collective psyche of Bitcoin. I don't know who's had the last interaction with Satoshi. It might have possibly been me. My very last email to Satoshi, I actually had told him that I had been invited to give a talk at the CIA. So he had already told me that he was going to step back. Um, I don't know if me telling him that I was just going to visit the CIA was the reason I've never heard from him again, but I certainly think it didn't help. Satoshi brilliantly designed the incentives so you don't need to pay anybody to you know, make sure that all transactions are valid because they get paid by the system itself. The reward for doing the work of processing transactions and making sure that there are no double spends is tied into the creation of new bitcoins. So the people who are being awarded new bitcoins are the same people who are making sure that double spends don't happen. So that's the way new bitcoins come into existence is you have these people who are validating the bitcoin transactions who are called bitcoin miners for the work of validating transactions and making sure that nobody cheats they're awarded new bitcoins. But then you need a way to limit the money supply because I mean validating the transactions is pretty quick. So there's, a, there's actually a process called proof of work where the miners have to run this algorithm that takes a lot of CPU time. It's, it, you can think of it like pulling lottery tickets. So all of the miners on the network are all, you know, they all validate the transactions and then they're all kind of participating in this lottery to see who will be awarded Bitcoins. And on average, every 10 minutes, somebody somewhere on the network is awarded new Bitcoins. There are um, fundamental promises made by the Bitcoin network about supply. And um, the, the supply function's uh, too complex to say out in words, but what you could think of is like every four years, about half the remaining Bitcoins are given out, okay? So for the first four years, every 10 minutes, 50 were given out, next four years, 25, and then next and so on. So eventually that kind of trails off and, and in the year 2140, no more will be issued. And that's how we know there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoins created because if you do the math, you know, that series works out to 21 million. One 100 millionth of a Bitcoin is the smallest Bitcoin unit, which the Bitcoin community has dubbed the Satoshi in honor of the creator. Bitcoin puzzles a lot of economists who would not have predicted that you'd be able to start from something that has no intrinsic value. I mean, there's zero value in the bits of data on your disk, and yet has managed to bootstrap itself into a, arguably the world's most valuable currency. And how that happened, I think, is a really interesting study in economics. It might need to make some economists rethink their ideas about money. It took some early adopters with enough faith to actually spend real money to purchase some Bitcoins to start to give it a value. Come first. So there are really three factors that drive interest in Bitcoin. The first is its decentralized nature. The second is its anonymity or really pseudonymity. And the third thing is its zero transaction costs. And what's interesting is that different people have been attracted to Bitcoin at different points in time by different elements of those three characteristics. So the first early adopters of Bitcoin were attracted to its decentralized nature. And so there was a lot of people who had a political um, motivation behind it. They might have been libertarians. They didn't like the idea of a, a central governing body of their currency. And that was, you know, and that, that kind of passion that was driven by you know, some of these ideological grounds is what's necessary to get something from nothing to that first step, just to get a few people involved and to have some value created. First of all, people don't think about where the dollar comes from, what, what spending that dollar means, and they don't think about taxation. So any of those things tend to be outside people's normal, why would you think about that when you're buying the bag of potato chips? There's no reason to. But if you're philosophically aware of these things, how, it, you know, how we create empire and how the U.S. is able to occupy so many, how can it afford financially to occupy so many countries, then you start thinking, how am I participating in this system? And that's by spending the Federal Reserve note. So for a lot of people, it's about, for them, it's about living their values. They want to use a peace dollar. And for them, the Bitcoin is working. There are a lot of different ways Bitcoin could succeed. 
I mean, my job as the, the core developer is to kind of concentrate on the core code and make sure the Bitcoin network keeps reliably processing transactions. And then to kind of be agnostic about how Bitcoin succeeds.